Okay, so in this example number two, uh, what we're going to do is just kind of focus on writing the transformations uh, provided to us for different types of functions. And this is going to help us really understand, you know, when the transformations are inside the function, outside the function, so we can differentiate between our values A, B, um, you know, H and K and understand what exactly is going on. Now, I'm actually going to skip this first example because this one actually, I'm going to come to this last. This one actually, um, as I'm teaching this, I think kind of makes, even though it's a simple function, it actually kind of gets a little bit more confusing as far as understanding, um, as far as transformation. So let's go back to that last. Let's work on this one. Now, when doing these problems, what I like to do is kind of understand what is inside the function. And what we can do is rewrite each one of these functions with kind of like parentheses. So inside the function is going to be what's going to be cubed, right? So we have this vertical stretch. That means we're multiplying by 3 outside of the function. We have this horizontal shift, which is subtracting a 2 inside the function. And then we have this vertical shift, which is adding a 1 outside the function. And all we want to do is just apply those transformations to the cubic function. So to do that, all I'm going to do is say y equals, I need to multiply by 3 on the outside. I'm going to subtract a 2 in the inside and then plus one. And you can see this function is going to, the transformations here would be the exact same transform there, it's just the function got changed. For e to the x, the inside of the function is going to be the power. So I'll write that as y equals e to the power, and I'm gonna just put that in parentheses for us to understand what's inside the function. So we need to multiply this function by a three. Oops, the one I put parentheses there. And then we need to subtract a two inside the function and then add a 1 outside the function, and that's how that would look. For the sine, the inside of the function is going to be the sine of x, right? So we could think of this as y equals sine of x, all right? So the x is going to be inside of the function. So to rewrite this with the transformations, it would be y equals 3 times the sine of x minus 2 plus 1. All right, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and work on here in the next one. So on this next one, now I'm multiplying uh, by a negative, and the inside of the function, I have 2x plus 1, which is a horizontal shift of uh, 1 half to the left. Make sure you understand that. And we have a vertical shift of 1 down, which I think I said, yeah, 1 half units to the left. Good. So the inside of the square root function is going to be what's under the radical, so it looked like this. Okay, so if we're multiplying by a negative on the outside, it would be negative. Oops. So it'd be y equals a negative square root of 2x plus 1. Now you can put that in parentheses if you want to, but since it's under the radical, we kind of understood now that it's outside. And then I'm going to close that radical like that so we know that the 3 is on the outside. For the cube root, it's going to be the exact same thing um, as the square root. It's just have a, has a different in index. So y equals the cube root of x. So there, if I just write that as y equals cube root, oops, sorry, that's a negative, right? Multiplying by a negative on the outside. So it's not a negative 3, that's multiplying by negative index is cube root 2x plus 1 minus 3. Now we have a logarithm, y equals ln of x. Again, the inside of the function is going to be ln of x. So this would be y equals the ln of x. So we're going to multiply that by a negative on the outside. And then on the inside, it would be 2x plus 1, which is your horizontal transformation. And then it's minus 3 on the outside. And a lot of times it's important when you're dealing with the logarithm um, or with the trigonometric function to make sure once you enter something inside that we put it in parentheses. See, when we don't have anything else, we don't need to put parentheses around the cosine of x. We can just assume that the x is on the inside, because um, obviously it has to be a function of a variable. But once we add, you know, some more letters or numbers or expressions, a lot of times we like to put them in parentheses just to make sure we can distinguish them between what's inside and what's outside. Um, so this example, the last example is y equals negative cosine of 2x plus 1 minus 3. All right, let's look at the last one, and then we'll go back to our answer here. Uh-oh. All right, so the next one is an absolute value function. Sorry if I kind of wrote the squared. I'm going to change that to an absolute value. Um, so inside the absolute value is, again, going to be what's inside of our function. So y equals 
absolute value of our x. Now let's actually go back to our function here. So this one we actually have to identify the transformation. So it says, given the transformation of the horizontal stretch, a factor of one third. So let's actually write out the function. Um, so this would be f of x. All right, so if it has a horizontal stretch, that means inside of the function, I am going to have one third of x. It's a reflection about the y-axis, that means my b is going to also be negative and a vertical shift. So my graph is going to look something like this, a negative one-third x and then a vertical shift up three. So there is nothing on the outside of the function, I'm not multiplying anything on the outside. Since it's a horizontal stretch, it's inside. Since it's a reflection about the y-axis, it's inside. And then since it's a vertical stretch, it's going to be outside. Okay, so now all I'm simply going to do is apply that operations to each of these functions. So y would equal, uh, let's see, absolute value of negative one third x plus three. In this case, um, now this one can kind of get a little confusing, so we'll manipulate this a couple times. Um, inside the function is going to be what's in the denominator. Y equals one over x. So we can rewrite this as y equals a one over negative one-third x plus three. Now this is where it gets kind of confusing and this is what I wanted to bring up with the linear equation. Usually we don't write um, with a fraction written in the denominator so it can get kind of confusing because you can think about this as the horizontal compression or stretch is going to be the same thing as like the vertical stretch or compression because if I wanted to simplify this to meaning get rid of the fraction in the numerator or in the denominator I could multiply by a three on the top and bottom. Therefore, I'd produce an equation that would look like this, three over negative x plus three. And now I could rewrite this as a negative being multiplied on the outside. So I could rewrite this like this, negative three times one over x plus three. And you might say, well, now you just changed it. And you're right, I did, but the transformations are still the same. So the thing I'm trying to understand thing I want to relate to this that it's important to get to till we go back to that first example is in this reciprocal function the horizontal stretch and horizontal stretch and compression is the same thing as the vertical stretch and compression it's actually not going to be different for the graph and that's not always the same I mean that's not the same for the other functions but in this case it is so that's kind of a, a nice thing something interesting to kind of follow and that just comes in my algebraic manipulation because usually we want to simplify out that red graph or that red function uh, for the quadratic, let's just go back to red. Uh, that's going to be what is raised to your power, so that'd be x squared. So I just rewrite this as y equals a negative one third x squared plus three. Now this one doesn't come up that much when we study quadratics, and the be reason being is anything squared is always going to be positive. So if you look at the graph of a quadratic, it's reflective about the y-axis. So it doesn't really even matter if we have a a reflection about the y-axis. This graph is going to, you know, could always be, um, that graph can be simplified just as being positive because the reflection doesn't really uh, affect the graph since it's an even function. And then last but not least, let's look at tangent. So that would be tangent of, of x. So I'll write it down here to get a little more space. So that'd be y equals tangent of negative one-third x plus three. Okay, so now let's go back to our first problem. And our first problem, what's interesting in this is, you know, let me kind of show you an exact same, another expression. So the horizontal and vertical transformations of x, the identity function, are exactly the same. So for instance, if I look at y equals negative two, oops, I'm sorry, x minus two, is that a vertical shift down two or is that a vertical shift two units to the right? Well, if we look at the graph, you could think about it either way. Because here's my identity graph, right? The identity graph looks something like that. So if you shift the graph two units to the right, that's the same thing as shifting the graph two units down. So when I'm combining two different transformations, I'm just gonna like add them up. So I'm doing two units to the right, and then I gotta also add one. So really what I have is y equals x minus one, and then I need to apply my vertical transformation, so my answer is gonna be y equal, or I'm sorry, my vertical stretch, so y is gonna be three x, which a vertical stretch is gonna be the same thing as the horizontal compression, um, and so therefore I'm gonna multiply that by three, and then this would be 
uh, minus one. Because if you take a look at this graph, let's just use one more. If I take this graph being shifted two units to the right and then up one, you can see that the new y-intercept is at y equals negative one. And then obviously now it's going to have a, a vertical stretch of three. So then it goes go down one and actually it's gonna go up three over one from there. So it'd be one, two, three over one. So actually the final graph would look something like that, but we're not really concerned right now about the final graph. I just wanted to kind of show you how to write the transformations. Okay, so that one's a little bit tricky, but as long, hopefully you got the rest of the examples, and that should be all good, at least for this example, until we get on to the next example.